right, welcome everybody uh, to our Friday Data Lecture Series. I wanna thank you guys for taking time out of your busy Friday to log in and connect with us. Uh, as always, I wanna thank our speakers committee. Uh, without their support, we would not be able to bring in such amazing artists, art historians, and uh, designers to speak with us each and every Friday. I, uh, I Today, we have the wonderful benefit of uh, having the wonderful Catherine Magel with us. Uh, Magel received her master's in fine art in uh, 1982 from the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University and her bachelor's in fine art in 1979 from Kansas City Art Institute. Over the course of her career, she has been the recipient of several awards, including the, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship Grant and a Connecticut Commission of the Arts grant. In 1991, Magel joined the US Scenic Artists Union and cultivated a unique aesthetic that incorporates painting and sculpting in large scale ceramic and mosaic pieces. She works mainly in ceramic tile, mosaic, glass, carved brick, and fiberglass. In designing and fabricating her work, Magel assessed attests to becoming part of the movement of people participating in social change and, revital and revitalization of place. So without further ado, uh, if you guys will give me one moment, give me one second. Uh, I will now give it over to Catherine Magel. Well, um, thank you very much uh, for that lovely introduction and um, you know, this great opportunity to speak and um, I know we'll have a chance for questions at the end, which I um, encourage everyone to just um, feel free to ask me questions at the end there. <clears throat> and um, you know, starting out, I, I kind of titled this from object to relationship a little <clears throat> bit ago, um, because from, you know, we're all art makers and object makers and so on. <clears throat> and, um, and in some ways I've, my work is about relationship with the people I make it for or I work with in collaboration. Um, and then at the bottom I have the, the, you know, the public and private. So I, I talk about that because um, we have our own personal work and then we have, you know, I do a lot of commission work where I work with many people and I'll, I'll get, you know, further along with that um, in my talk as we go. And so everything you see, this is a, just a painting um, because I, I am a, a painter, you know, I consider myself a painter, sculptor, ceramicist, kind of all mixed together here. And um, so, and I knew that, you know, the conversation, the presentation would be about my public work probably and its history. And then I pondered about it and I thought, as I always do, how much of the discussion you know, will bring about in my work, my personal work and my collaborative, you know, work as well. And so there's a balance there. So I think I'll begin, um, you know, so you can see this kind of type of trajectory, trajectory a little bit about, you know, um, that. So um, painting ceramics, you know, both, they seem like they both offer emotional expression where the process asks for kind of a physical, intellectual, and intuitive to work together. And so um, let's hope I go the right direction with this. Uh-oh. <laughs> Hold on a second. There we go. Um, and I'm just going to another painting here. This is called Scuba Bunny Sonata. And often I use dissimilar kinds of objects and images put together to create a new meaning. And um, even though I studied pottery, you know, I, I love to paint and I love to layer and I see this great connection. Whoops, something happened here. Okay. So, um, this is uh, uh, a piece called Cloud and it's really about finding images in the clouds and kind of bringing them forth and so they don't really have any relationship to each other or any they don't define anything other than our imagination but our imagination really comes from who we are <clears throat> what we're capable of and how 
expansive we can think or not expansive we can think. So I think that freedom is so beautiful. We learned it when we were kids. And um, so I just wanted to put this piece in. Let's see. Here's, here's where I'm trying again to kind of mix ceramics and painting. And, you know, I, I just, I always felt that even though I studied pottery, I wanted to paint with clay. I didn't want to be a potter. Um, and so you can see evidence of that already. Um, and so here's some more, you know, work. And, and, and none of this is in, in any kind of order necessarily by when I made it. I'm just showing kind of the best work to illustrate what I'm talking about here. Um, on the right, at the bottom, you'll see that's Val Cushing. And I studied with him and Ed Alfred. And um, he was my professor. And he was a potter. And he was a great influence, really mainly because of his thoughts. And I just wanted to read something he wrote me that was so beautiful. Um, <clears throat> and so this is what he, I'm quoting him now. Um, he wrote, hey, I want to tell you about my studio. And I'm glazing. And nature is all around me. There was a butterfly chasing a swallow. It almost brought me to tears. This paper-like thin, delicate creature and its courage and strength to defend. Swallows eat butterflies. To see a butterfly chasing a bird, it's beautiful. Getting back to what is beautiful, he always cited the connection nature had to, to us. But more than this, he listened to see the messages like this one given to him. And then he would share the profound beauty of that message with me. And it was more than anything else for me that, to learn this from him because it supported his work so much. And his attitude about life was really part of his work. So I began to realize our philosophy of life is really our art. And it just was so powerful for me. I wanted to share that for all of the students because it's so important to pay attention to those things. So then the, the, the picture above is my mother and father. My mother was an artist. My dad sold, you know, original prints. And so I did get kind of, um, you know, this influence from way back. And then on the left is Ken Ferguson, who was at the Kansas City Art Institute. And he, I can quote him as saying, do what you love, your work comes first. In other words, you know, make sure that you're happy, you love what you do in life. And we, we hear this constantly and you'll never work a day in your life, which is really true to some extent. Um, so um, there's always something new to say with your work. And it's, we have discoveries every single day. And um, our lives are about our work and what we are trying to do. <clears throat> what is meaningful and what matters about what we do and what matters to others, to myself, it's, it's all a big journey. And um, this is where I'm just pouring, you know, I don't know how many of you are ceramicists, <clears throat> um, just using cast slip and cutting it and pouring it and creating textures in little environments. I did a few pieces like that. Um, so when I talk about my work, I, I want to just say I'm involved in this process of making things because it, you know, it matters, it matters. And I try to step back and think why it matters to me and why it might matter to other people, what we're making. And so, um, and when I think, I'll go back here a little bit, what, you know, and, and then I think I'm interested in beauty. I think I'm interested in what is beautiful and does it matter? You know, not everybody's going to think my work's beautiful. That's fine. But I wanted to, to just say this because this is um, how I think of beauty. And it has something to do with biology, like bees and flowers. Um, people like certain things. But also history, culture, and fashion. And I think pleasure is very political. Pleasure is part of what controls people. Advertising is directed at our pleasure and taste is tied to class and hierarchy, a social structure, and has and that has something to do with beauty too and status quo. So all this gets all these words get mixed up in what what is tasteful and what is beautiful. And then that shifts. And so when I say, you know, um, beauty, I'm, I'm saying it in the, in this sense. Um, 
So I wanted to start with this. Um, this was a commission, and um, it's called Reflecting on a River, and it was really about rebuilding and collaboration that began with the passion of the community to want to see a um, an area of the city. We were trying to reconnect to nature and also be kind of kind of become a little more of a river city. You know, the Mississippi. Um, we're, we're not really a river city. We're trying to be a river city. So we did this mural in that with that in mind. So whether it's social, political, environmental, or cultural transformations that take place, public art is kind of when you're hired to do it, you're, those are some of the things that can happen. So this is the renderings from research I did about, um, you know, the, the Missouri flora and fauna. And then this is kind of the model of it went along a flood wall. And so this is um, kind of the model. It's on a bike path so they can understand what it's going to look like pretty much. And so you'll you'll see more of this. Um, so this is beginning the work. Now this is pretty huge. It's 290 feet long, and you know undulates from six to eight feet high in different areas. So this is how it began with squares, and working from specifically from the renderings. Whoops, wrong way. Now here's the very beginning. Um, of the mural and I started with these microscopic creatures so this is ceramic 12 by 12 inch tiles with relief and we tested glaze after glaze after glaze so it's a huge amount of work um, originally it started at a six six thousand dollar project project and somehow became a five hundred wait wait um see a five hundred thousand dollar project in the end and we outreached to over fifteen hundred people um, during this project and included um, schools and um, so even though it was designed there are these areas like in in this this slide you can see little tiny fish children made those from all the schools we went to and then we might make the larger carved fish so they added vitality and texture to our design and um, this was a three-year project, so this is quite extensive. You can see our larger images and then the small fish on the right that, um, that the children made, and they're kind of mixed in and woven in. So this starts with water, and it goes into, like, land, and then it goes into the night wall. And um, in the night wall, we started with creating fossils, and we made molds of fossils, and then we... We worked with kids that had didn't have dexterity, but they could make you know they could press clay into molds. And here's a close up of some of the fossils, and so they could learn about positive, negative, and you know what are our state fossils and things like that. And you can see we did a lot of carving and relief work that's pretty intense. Um, and then this goes into. Um, starts to go into the migration section of the project right here and um, this is kind of the fossil earth area um, let's see yeah okay I'm trying to see what my next slide is. There we go. Okay, so this is a bit of a close-up of, you know, I'm showing you kind of down the line here. So we come to the migration section of butterflies, and this is very high relief at this point. You can kind of see butterflies are resting on a log that's coming way out of the wall. And so from a distance, it looks kind of like a Jackson Pollock painting. When you come up close, you see, oh, they're butterflies. So that part was fun. Here's kind of how high relief, very difficult excuse me, very difficult to install. So um, then we did a memorial section where we worked with Kids Clubhouse and the birds kind of coming off were made by over 130 people that had were going through the grieving process, mostly children. And they'd write little notes to the one that they lost. We'd embed it in the clay bird and then it would burn out in the firing as a way to send the message up and then they could come visit the birds whenever they wanted to on the wall. So this was 
major community outreach project for me, my first one. And we worked with Missouri School for the Blind, nursing homes, homeless shelters. I mean, just all over the city. It was pretty incredible. So <clears throat> I go to my second project is a mosaic project. Um, and this uh, was to create, I think, nine different habitats um, for Missouri conservation. And um, I had never done mosaic, but I knew clay, and I figured I could, I could figure this out. So this is the confluence. This is, I'm just showing a few of these. And it's like an outdoor museum. That's, that was their idea they wanted an outdoor museum of art, you know, relating with nature again. <clears throat> And here's one of the, the uh, exploration stations that has, this is of the croplands. And so there's the mosaic of the croplands. There's a place where you can make rubbings and a booklet and read about croplands in this area. There's a close-up of the, um, you know, it was really fun to mix colors. It's like painting with glass, very similar. Again, I'm working again with materials. I feel like I'm painting in a way with materials instead of paint. Um, this was the slough. Um, and then you can kind of get a glimpse of behind there. You can go into that kiosk and kind of read about that environment, that habitat. Um, and here's just a few of the other ones. Um, uh, prairie, prairie lands, bottom hardwood forest, and um, a forest re regeneration is on the bottom left. And so that was a, a very uh, good project to learn how to mosaic. I'm kind of coming back a little bit here. I'm dovetailing with some painting because you can get very involved in your, your public art and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> I am an artist so I want to do my own work. But it's so important to keep that part of yourself alive because that's who you are. And so when I talk about you know some of my paintings, this, this one in particular and other ones, I draw kind of from collecting images from many sources. They could be pop culture, traditional culture, references, patterns, cellular formations, nature, dreams, political illusion, whatever. And, and these compositions, um, you know, can be upside down, right side up images. Um, and uh, it's, you know, I kind of deny any kind of perspective in some of my pieces. Um, and, and part, part of that reasoning is it, it states to me that we cannot see everything at once, really, and that, you know, we can't present everything at once. And, it, and it, to me, it also states that we can't see everything for what it is, really, all at once. And so it's really um, part of how I construct my meaning uh, with my work. Um, and then here's another work. Another part of my work is always I'm finding I'm bouncing back between two and three dimensions. So this is a huge painting. This is probably 20 feet by 10 feet. And um, so these these clay pieces that you can kind of see um, are um, on the surface and kind of coming forward. Um, this, this is a painting that went from black and white to color. And then the cloud on the left was made of all these little sparkly things and pieces of jewelry and so on and it really was about my mother passing away it's called good night and um and that was you know in honor of her and here's a close-up of the um, cloud which is kind of like a mosaic really so i'm starting to mix painting and mosaic and you know the skills i learn and other things i do come into my work which is and then somebody saw that painting and decided they wanted to make a dress <laughs> of using that, you know, using the painting. So I'm like, oh, great, go for it. So I have a dress like that. Um, I wear it once in a while. It's fun. So you never know what's going to happen with your career. <laughs> and then um, just some other ceramic work that I've done. Um, so I still do ceramics, uh, even though I do probably more, you know, um, commission work. Um, I still do my own personal work. And these are just a couple pieces. Um, I've been playing around with the studio, D different fragments. You know, I started off very young embedding fragments into clay platters way, way back in undergraduate school. 
and, and, and this is different in the sense that it's all fragments and there's really no clay that I worked with at all. I just used all fragments. So the work has changed in the sense that I do this with my paintings, but I use images. Um, so there's some relationship there. Um, this is part of a painting. And it's, it's always changing, you know, something about these little shapes and fragments and start to come out the more you work. Here's the full painting. And the reason I'm kind of putting this painting in is it relates to one of the commissions. I have this flower shape that keeps coming back and I'll show you as we go. But this is um, another commission I did called um, Earth Rabbit. And this was the first time I did a sculptural mosaic. Um, and I had to kind of figure out how am I going to make something that can withstand the outdoors and the mosaic won't fall off of it. And so I kind of developed, you know, um, an armature, you know, a metal armature, then it gets sprayed with foam. We carve the foam down and then that gets covered with fiberglass and then over the fiberglass goes the mosaic. This is very, um, part of my knowledge is coming from being a scenic at the Muni and um, we know a chemical engineer that knows how to make a foam that you can carve that can get sprayed on and um, and so I kind of went in that direction because of knowing some of these um, techniques that I just started putting together for myself. Um, now the rabbit is kind of you know he, he was an outreach project we worked with inner city kids and so I started with stories about rabbits and folklore and we got into you know Br'er Rabbit and Bugs Bunny and so on and realized that most of those stories were about you know the, that the rabbit kind of played this uh, trickster and cultural hero which is interesting because that's how they survived you know, Bugs Bunny is our greatest um, trickster cultural hero that we know of where, you know, he was always saying, um, you know, being in places that he knew he could survive in and escaping, you know, the, the uh, hunter or Br'er Rabbit would say, don't throw me in that briar patch, but he knew that he could escape from the, you know, so it was like another, I, I love that about this because every image on this rabbit does not define who that rabbit is. It has no relationship really to him, but he just survives and take, takes life on and every challenge kind of joyfully, you know, in life. So the rabbit is not a martyr. And I just love that whole idea. Um, so he's very symbolic and proud of who he is and knows how to live life well. And so he stands for a lot of great things in the community, especially for the children in that area. It was really powerful. Um, and this is just kind of us putting it together in the studio. It was a huge amount of work. This, I, I'm always surprised, like, wow, I don't realize what I'm getting into until I get into it. That's okay. Because um, you can always figure it out. <clears throat> Once you say yes, you'll figure it out. So um, <clears throat> now he's in Webster Groves, believe it or not, at the rec center. Here he was downtown for a few years. And sculptures move around in different areas. And... Um, these are the kids from the Grand Grand Arts Academy, um, which is downtown. Now, this is a different kind of, um, this is a rendering. I wanted to show you maybe what, you know, how you might start with a project. This is for a wall in California, and it is mosaic, and this is the rendering. So it's 100 feet long by 3 feet high, so it's a very long, I always get these long wall projects. <laughs> um, so here it is, in it's place. Um, no community outreach with this particular project. Um, just my design and it's about the tidal pools and so on and the beaches in California. It's for an art collector and um, this is made with tiny little pieces of smalty glass which is fabricated or you know made in Italy and Mexico and it, this was fabricated in Germany. Um, and so this is fun to see a close-up of how some of these creatures look like by the way we mix color with glass, how they look like they're underwater. Um, and then all the colors of all these tiny pieces of glass 
uh, mixed together. It's really color mixing, completely color mixing. And then the sizes of these tiles can change and create another layer. Um, so it's layering. It's so much like painting to me. Um, and th I guess that's a, a little bit of a close-up of how, you know, using the warm and cool colors and how much color in one place can kind of determine so much here. Um, and then this is the end of it. This is the sand area, which you can see it's just not sand colors. It's so many beautiful glass colors all together. Um, and I just love that about mosaic. Um, this is quite a big project here. It's um, a wading pool. It's all handmade from clay that we made in the studio. This was a huge project. It was probably a $48,000 project. And it was for a private um, uh, residence. This just kind of shows, you know, our, how we cut out shapes and then all the rest of the tile we made. We, we did put some glass in with it, some for the, for the smaller detail. So it's glass and clay and so on. And here's some, you can see the big glass cutout or clay cutouts of the flowers and maybe some of the lily pads that we just glazed. And then, um, I think that fish, the orange fish is made up of different uh, clay pieces. We just cut it out into a pattern. Um, and this is kind of an example of how we might work with clay and actually design and cut it specifically for a design. So it, sometimes it's just squares, sometimes it's all shapes. Um, it's like putting a puzzle together. It gets pretty complex. And so you can kind of see the, one of the birds here of what we were just cutting out over there. Um, now this is uh, again another three-dimensional piece that's in Webster. Um, and this was fun because I wanted the bottom of it to be blue and yet I wanted it to have lots of other colors in it. So you know that's the first time I kind of played around with that idea in this respect. But then you, you in the flower area you can kind of begin to see where with the mosaic you draw, you kind of draw, the flow develops the form. Um, I just think color is just so beautiful. And, um, you know, to me form really means everything. You don't, you don't really make anything or think outside of a form. And, you know, it's, it's hard, to, it's kind of hard to articulate why, you know, it's, it's like a bit like playing the piano, you know, you obviously people's fingers learn how to play the piano and they don't sit and think about how each note, you know, about each note and, and therefore, you know, working with color and form the way I am working, there's kind of a process that goes on that I can't really tell you about, though I have a lot to say about my work. The words come after the work, I think. The ideas happen within the process. You know, it's like when you learn to play the piano, all of a sudden you finally, your, your hands kind of move automatically or walking. It's kind of like that. So I can tell you a little bit afterwards, but in the process of making, you know, I'm just going along, figuring it out as I go and, and using my imagination and making it all happen. Um, and I, I just wanted to show this painting and to, to show the connection to the public art to now my private painting. There's some relationships to how I'm working here. Um, let's see. Um, this was a mural down at the but the Devolver Metrolink station. And again, it's just a way to point out the two-dimensional, three-dimensional relationship that I just love. These are metal cutouts the cage with the birds on the outside, the, the, um, the ladder, uh, and then the history museum, since it's near the history museum. And it's really about the community. We, we outreached with, to some, uh, with some, uh, homeless men <clears throat> and they helped us figure out how to do this. <laughs> I mean, and, and I designed it. And, um, another woman that worked with me, Con Christensen, she was that, you know, did a lot of the outreach connection for the project. So um, it changed, and we added some images from the schools around town, and uh, uh, 
worked with, this is a great collaboration with an industry and they actually cut out the metal pieces and after we gave them a CAD um, drawing and um, they cut it with a water jet cutter and so and then some scenics painted one of the cutouts to look like the History Museum and um, so there's a lot of collaboration that can happen when you work this large you can't do this all by yourself anymore you're not just doing a painting here and there this is about 40 feet wide by 10 feet high and so just installing it on the wall is a huge production because being outdoors you have to really make sure that it doesn't fall and hurt anyone or it lasts as long as possible so there's UV protected coating a lot of research involved in that just some um, saying it's really fun but you know, you're kind of hired to figure all that out as well and um, the name of this piece was vehicle destination imagination so it's a kind of about city life um, in St. Louis so there's lots of images to look at and ponder and try to figure out what is your relationship to this object and how can you not only relate to the yourself but other people in your community there's a close-up of us kind of laying out the ladder to see how that fits. Um, and um, <clears throat> so, you know, another part of doing public art is creating these spaces where people take pride, feel safe, and claim ownership is really what starts to happen when you're working with community. And anything you put outside in the public arena, you are working with community, and they should be first on your in your mind to relate to historically like I said politically environmentally whatever whatever way you choose but at the same time um, are you going to create something that that is part of they become part of the process I think that's the most powerful and here this gives you a scale a little bit it looks a little shorter than it should because it's kind of a skewed but it gives you a little bit of a scale now I was thinking we could take a little trip here <laughs> to China and um, it, well, I went to an artist in residency I've been to China three times I don't know why maybe I was you know from a past life maybe I was Chinese I don't know anyway <laughs> but um, this is Shanghai and um, though I went to Nanjing and Jingdezhen um, I wanted to talk about it because whenever you go to another country to work with other artists and see another culture it so so influences your work beautifully so I say do it do it do it as much as you can so Jingdezhen is the place where you go to um, it's the porcelain capital of the world and so the Chinese have been painting you know the designs for 5,000 years over and over and over and over again it's all repetitive 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 but they're genius at it they're so skilled we can't even come close so artists from other countries say okay well we're gonna go over there and and use the you know the pottery forms and the skills of the artisans and create works for galleries and so there's a place called pottery workshop in China in Jingdezhen where you can go do that and um, it's fantastic I mean it's just a great opportunity I highly recommend going so this was the first place I went <clears throat> and then some of the things there's a residency called San Bao and some of the the leftover products from some of these you know places in Jingdezhen get tossed out or tossed away or whatever and so they started making these great sculptures and walls with forms pottery forms and this is part of um, beautiful part of China where San Bao is lovely area um, it was just great to see how they build and all the different types of things going on in China. It's just so diverse. These are some great photos of resident artists that have created works and, you know, maybe they've left some things behind and someone starts to build a wall and they keep adding on to it. And now there's, you know, these great walls that are a collaborative effort that are fantastic to see. Um, there <clears throat> when I went to Jing to Jen it was the year of the rabbit and so this is kind of what you see all over this little village uh, this vil little village that they call it is probably has at least a million people in it um, but it's all just that town all they do is ceramics 
It's really interesting to me. They have other towns that might just do metal. It's really cool. So here's one of the factories, and here's Mao Zedong, of course, um, where they do, you know, the slip casting and um, put it together and they sell it. And then we went to areas like this, which are way, way, way out in the middle of nowhere, and they're living in, you know, with no heat, and um, they use fire and other things to stay warm, and um, it's just a whole nother lifestyle. So the resources that we're used to having are not there. <laughs> so I found that so incredibly um, amazing to be around. And what I wanted to talk about was uh, a little bit about that was, um, you know, working without resources when we went to Nanjing was um, very freeing. The Chinese culture has a completely different logic and set of ideals that was very valuable for me to see. And their rich history and progressive growth are just juxtaposed everywhere. So our, um, you know, our, our kind of group of artists really made some great work. So I didn't have any tools really. I had, I think, a jigsaw and some luon. And um, we were supposed to be working in clay, but they couldn't get it to us. So I just started cutting up Luan shapes and putting them together. You can see in this piece, and I created this, this sculpture. And I, you know, I could find paint, but we couldn't find a lot of the sculptural materials and tools that we actually needed. But we did create great things because of that. <clears throat> and here it is in a, the Contemporary Museum of Art there, where we had our exhibition. And this is the other side, and I found an old bamboo ladder that I painted and stuck in my sculpture, which was really fun. It's kind of kind of all about the the, you know, to me that's a symbol that I use in my painting sometimes, like in that mural that you saw, and here it was just there, and it was bamboo, and I thought, wow, this is awesome. So I was having the greatest time. This is the studio we were working in, and we just kind of took it over. Um. <laughs> But, and then here's some of the painting I found, you know, I couldn't find canvas or anything. I found old curtains and there was this great window and I just started painting on the curtains and layering like I do with my paintings, but with curtains. And, and then having that light coming through, I was just having a blast. And it was just dealing with what was at hand and what was in front of me that made it so fantastic. Um, and here I am there just kind of crouched down playing around on the floor with some more imagery and a lot of it's about the culture um, a lot of things that they do that we don't do like to celebrate they let off firecrackers and so I think this painting is really a little bit about that experience it just kind of comes in but when I did get home you know my work became uh, certainly the influence was still there and I, I used these parasols and um, created uh, these these are this is a wall piece and then to me the the influence is obvious um, but it's also <clears throat> I'm using some quilt patterns at below that are very American um, and this is an artist I'm sure you're familiar with um, Joseph Stella and uh, I started looking at you know after doing those kind of cutout things I looked at his work and thought, hmm, that's interesting. It's a wall piece, but it's cut out. Um, and so I got a commission, and this is the model made out of paper. Um, and I started playing with, I wanted to do something with metal, not clay, that represented the way I worked in China. Um, but metal, and it could withstand the outdoors. So this is the other side of the, the paper piece that I made. And here it is, um, still in progress of painting it outside here, but... This is a metal piece that I made that really was from my experience working with no materials to be found in China. Now I have a CAD uh, machine to, you know, computer to come up with these shapes with that can be cut out with a water jet now and then welded together and painted, which was great fun to then come back and transfer all that knowledge, you know, back into a, a sculpture I could put out in the public here. Um, and then I think, you know, the technology today where we can take a rendering like this is walking cat 
um, and then place it in an environment so someone can understand how it's going to look you know with Adobe Photoshop or whatever we're using these days is really fun and so as I think of all the collaborations with industry and you know technology and um, people that I've come across it's been so much fun here's the actual sculpture being carved of walking cat which is not done yet it's, a, it's about at this stage but it's about nine feet high um, and this piece you probably have seen in the community uh, is uh, I just wanted to put this in to show you know what the walking cat might look like with mosaic on it at some point with different images on it this is really about the, the harmony um, of jazz and also the history of jazz and we could go into long stories about that but that is um, Louis Armstrong and Vic Speederbeck who used to kind of sneak around and play together during a time when black and whites were not allowed to play together it was taboo but they did anyway and that was the precursor jazz was the precursor to the civil rights movement which I did not know until I was commissioned to do a piece for ja you know about jazz so that was the story I wanted to tell I thought it was very powerful especially today um, and then this is just typical work I might do on the side you know like for fountains in a mall which is in the you know in Chesterfield <clears throat> um, and again this is a more decorative um, piece and this is kinda how it's laid out before it's installed getting ready um, so you can see it's big long strips of mosaic we put on mesh and there's a little bit of the process of how we mosaic onto mesh and then that gets you know picked up and put in place so you don't put every little piece in place you put the whole thing on at once um, and that's quite a process now then the, the latest thing I'm doing right now is a very fun collaboration with two men from smart controls who are engineers and we are starting a new company called Art Sculpt International and we are selling uh, tile and mosaic for artists to work with and mosaic artists and artists and <clears throat> the, on the right side we have a little with their MakerBot 3D machine they made like a cutter so I can make the same shape over and over and over again and um, we're we're doing all kinds of things they've made um, shapes for uh, benches I'm gonna make with a MakerBot and the process is so much faster it's just so fun so um, these are some of the products we're kind of playing with the cutter can kind of make these much faster and this might be something that I like to create that you know I can sell to other artists and they can add them to a larger piece and start from there and create new works um, these leaf shapes these are some of the things we're trying to make in the in the uh, you know for other artists to work with and so we're just having a lot of fun and I think um, other artists could play with these and make new patterns and designs and um, use things and and so this this is a um, one of the things that to me is the most fun is you know here's a mosaic on the left that I did and then we kind of put it in uh, you know put it on a form here and I you can see this moving of how we could create these benches using mosaic and just taking a flat pattern <clears throat> and um, they did this you know with their computer this is beyond me so this is why it's so fun to collaborate and I'm really excited because now we're gonna do a series of benches that are mosaic that are in that that form and other kind of simple forms and um, they can be colors and you know whatever somebody they can kind of be custom made um, for anyone really um, around the world so I think that's kind of where Art Sculpt International that's kind of what we're thinking and so this is probably the most exciting part for me is I'm kind of moving on to something a little bit more in my control I'm not waiting for a commission to come and hire me I'm gonna just start doing it myself so that that's um, important to mention because uh, you know we're, we're freelance and so how do we make a living when we're depending on you know the gallery or we're depending on the commission coming through or whatever that's all good and I say go for it as much as you can but on the side 
there's always that personal work that that way like how can I create an and a revenue engine in between all that so I'm not unemployed for six months and th those kinds of things so this is my idea to do to, you know to make that a little bit easier anyway so I guess we should open this up to questions and um, you know any 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 part of what I've talked about any aspects um, and I'm showing you just a very small part of my work I know it's kind of quick uh, not to see you know all my paintings or all my ceramics you're getting a little taste of everything but um, hopefully it's enough to give you some idea you know why I'm where I am right now um, so thank you for listening and um, please ask me some questions awesome thank you Catherine for the for the the overview uh, the, yeah. the the nice cross-section if you will of uh, you know your your broad career we did get a few uh, questions to start in the chat you guys uh, feel free to put any questions that you have for Catherine in the chat or if you want to turn your video screens and your mics on you know feel free to chime in to the conversation uh, but to get you started Catherine uh, uh, Emily had a question uh, she said, how do you attach uh, clay pieces to your paintings? Some of the like layered uh, collage work that uh, I believe you showed at the beginning of the presentation. Yes, um, with some of those, I, I think the, the painting uh, was done on a, uh, a fabric that could hang on the wall. And so in that case, I just, literally used a nail and um, you know had a place in the painting where I knew that piece went and hammered it into the wall through the painting and just hung the work right on the, the nail. There's other times where I actually built a just a wooden structure that <clears throat> um, held the painting. Yeah, it held the, the ceramic pieces and the painting was on the wood behind it. So there's been a few different ways I've done that. Um, I like the easy method of just hanging the work on the wall right through the painting. Nice. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Another question we have is uh, from Lauren. Uh, when working on large commissions like the rabbit, uh, mm -hmm. how does a team come together to help you complete the project? And do you have a group of people that you consistently work with for those large scale projects? Now, that's a very good question. Um, that is, um, I've developed a team, but I think in the beginning, and I would actually hire interns from, well, Webster University, Wash U, and SIUE mainly, um, and students would come in, and they weren't always ceramic majors either, um, and they would work sometimes for credit and sometimes pay. Some people would even volunteer in the beginning, and over time, I, you know, I snagged a couple long-term um, people that stayed with me for a long time and most of the time I'd be writing letters for graduate school and I'd lose everyone and which was fine we've stayed in touch all these years but um, but I do have a few people in the community that are here that I've trained that stick with me um, now that we're starting this manufacturing we're going to be hiring more people um, and how do I you know how do I pull it together? Um, sometimes you, I had to make a decision. I need, you know, some, some of the people I hire need to be skilled. And then some other people don't need to be as skilled that can kind of fill in and start from the bottom up. And so um, I usually let people kind of gravitate to what they like doing. Like some people might want to make glazes and others might want to mosaic or something. But, um, you know, those early projects, I'd put in way too much time myself uh, because I'd be working around the clock and people would be coming and going. So it's not so easy to manage. Um, but again, over the years, I have a couple of people I can rely on. I get a project, I call them, they come in and help me. And then the project's over and they all go home. So um, now that the manufacturing's coming in, I'm hoping to keep people all year round. So that's how it's changed a little bit. I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah. Um, just for, uh, you know, those who are sort of, you know, 
novices to the 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 public art uh, sort of realm, uh, could you I explain a little bit about like how some of those uh, commissions uh, were were these projects that you you know applied to, or were these like organizations that reached out to you because they were familiar with like your your community outreach uh, projects? Uh, just yeah. From a, from a novice standpoint, like how does one get into that? Well, uh, you know, a good place to start is um, if I'm sure you're familiar with calls for artists. And so there'll be many calls. There's websites like uh, publicart.org and Cafe Entry and um, Any Artist. And those are free. And you can go on those sites and they have calls for artists and they have deadlines and you um, send your portfolio and a statement of your work and your, you know, a lot of this you can upload and have access to. And as projects come in, you can just apply and kind of click, 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 and it's all there. Um, and so I do a bit of that. Um, and there are times where I've just been asked to apply for things. Um, and then I was lucky enough to get it um, or asked to just do a project. Um, and that's usually people that have already seen my work. So it's a little mix after a while of both. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm getting to the stage at this point where I may not take every project because I realize that some of them don't have a budget that could handle what they think they can. And, you know, there <laughs> are, a lot of times if you have to be careful, um, everybody wants you to work, but they don't, not everybody understands what they're asking you to do. And so at that point, you have to kind of know, um, either you have to scale way down, you know, what might be scaling down so much that the work might not even be uh, exciting enough. So I might, I might say no sometimes, which is very new for me because, you know, <laughs> when you're starting out, you say yes to everything. Um, but now I know, you know, I might not have made money on my first couple projects. And back when I was younger, that's good. That's okay. But as you get older, you have to start making sure you make that um, extra money. So um, you have to make some kind of a profit. So there's a lot to, to that. Um, but um, I don't know. I hope that answered some of that question about where to start. Oh, no, that's great. Um, I think Jerry's got a couple of, uh, of, of uh, business, business practice questions for you. Um, uh, Jerry asks, do you have contracts with the employees that you work with? Yeah. Um, I do. Um, that's interesting because my very first contract, I went to Lawyers for the Arts, um, and they will assign you someone that will help you in St. Louis. Um, and... Uh, they helped me write my very first contract that kind of protected me and I've used that format for a while and if somebody that doesn't give me a contract I'll say okay I'll write the contract or if they they send me a contract I'll say well this is okay but I got to add this to it and you know just realizing that everybody wants a win-win um, is important because that's really what we want but you still have to go well what about the weather and you know, what if something happens and I have to write this clause in there and so on. So lawyers for the arts helped me kind of come up with some of that jargon originally. Um, and I have worked without a contract. Um, I, it's, I would never probably do that again because it outlines, you know, your, your timeline um, for the client so they know when to expect the work. And uh, if you don't do that from the beginning, then, you know, there can be a lot of misunderstanding. So and you want to know, you know, when you want to get paid and, um, you know, 50% up front, maybe another third before you finish. And then the very last bit after it's installed and delivered. So all that needs to be in a contract. So if they ask you 20 times to redesign something for your design fee, you want to have at least, you know, a, a fee that it's an upcharge if they're going to ask you a hundred times to change it, you know, like enough is enough kind of a thing. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll change a design maybe twice. And then after that, I have to ask for an upcharge because otherwise they take advantage of your time. 
they, they don't know they're doing that. It's not like um, they just don't realize the amount of work that's involved. Mm -hmm. So you have to protect yourself. And I think a contract will do that in many ways. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry also wanted to know, do you copyright your work? Um, I used to. <laughs> I, I know I did with the flood wall. Um, I haven't really... I haven't done that for a while. I probably should, but um, originally I did. I had that in mind, and and I think um, I don't know what I think about that right now. I, you know, it's a good question. I don't know if I have a great answer for it. Um, I figure the work is a copyright itself to some extent, but I know anybody's going to do whatever they want, and I I also think that yeah, we're all influenced by each other. That's great. Um, I kind of like that. Uh, and I've had people try to do similar things of mine in terms of, you know, like from the flood wall. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's great. I, it's never going to look like mine and I'm never going to make what they make. So it's, I kind of think it's okay, you know, to um, be inspired. And if somebody tries to um, do something similar, that's, doesn't really bother me. It just asks me to get better <laughs> as an artist. Like, okay, what's the next step? <laughs> um, like maybe, maybe this is the time when I evolved the language, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. So um, Jerry would also like to know, how do you handle having to redo or fix a piece? I feel like this is, this is a big question for a lot of artists, especially those have, who have ever made something that has been damaged. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting question because, um, you know, there's maintenance uh, on mm -hmm. all public art that's out there. And I think whoever owns it has the responsibility to make sure it's maintained. And um, over time, I've actually uh, done tile restoration for people. Um, and I've also done... Uh, tile and mosaic restoration for other artists and also for um, the Metrolink station for some metal pieces that needed to be repainted of, you know, a local artist that didn't really want to do the work. And um, I know there's one of my pieces that needs some restoration. And I think um, that's just typical. I usually, when I, you know, finish a piece, I have a maintenance um, sheet I give the the um, client so they know what they're up against in, in order to is it high maintenance is it low maintenance what do you do um, and um, so they can maintain their own work but you're not in trouble if let's say um, in three years something needs to be repainted you know you're not you know you they might ask you to do it for money they have to pay you um, they, you know, I have to reseal sometimes the flood wall because it has to be resealed, the grout joints, so they stay waterproof for, you know, every three years. Now they've come up with a new grout that doesn't even need that. So this is awesome. Technology changes, um, but it's okay to, um, to uh, go... kind of restore something and but you need to get paid for it still oh, absolutely yeah um uh jerry do you want to sort of elaborate on on this last question um just because I, I don't really know the context of that right um so the question is have you ever had x issues with your clients um because that's one part of some artists um and i'm thinking of how graphic designers deal with ethics issues with their client or um their clients or not um ethics like uh, um they're they're doing something that might affect you in an adverse way and you have to stand up for yourself kind of thing or yeah uh-huh or I, maybe you don't want to do it that way um oh yes um, I've never had trouble with that until recently, strangely enough. Mm. And I have a client mm. and, um, they didn't want a contract. 
Um, but it was a large sum of money, and I thought, well, I need the money. It's right around COVID. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so uh, what happened was, and this is recent, I was commissioned to do a large scale sculpture and um, they were really late with the money, like six to eight months late after I got this project with money. And I said, are you sure you want to do this? I mean, it's like eight months later. I mean, what's up with this? I need 50%. I'm not starting the project until you pay me. You know, I know that much. Um, never start a project until you get some money, <laughs> but 50% um, mm -hmm. up to start. So. Uh, they did give me half the money and then I started the project and I get pretty far and then all of a sudden December 1st I get this letter saying stop all work on project we have um, a mix up with some kind of they, they were very vague you know uh, there's religious connotations about this and that um, it's kind of it was a piece and, and they, they specifically wanted a dog this is for a veterinary research center on a campus on a college campus they, they actually told me what they wanted me to make. And I didn't like that, but I did it. They wanted this animal in the kind of the same position as the rabbit, because everybody wants the rabbit for some reason. I don't know why, but anyway. So I said, okay, I'll just do this. And I wasn't really happy about it, but I thought, okay, it's money and I'll do it, whatever. So they say, stop, stop, stop everything. Okay, it's been five months that they asked me to stop the project. So what do I do? I have, a, I have this piece half done. I have all these materials, all this money invested, all these people that I've been working with are gone now. I have to store the work, I have to do all this. And I, I finally wrote him a letter, I said, due to your, your abandonment of the project, I am canceling this project. You know? And so I canceled the project and they said, well, you can't cancel the project because we're supposed to be good stewards and we, we're gonna find a new location. And I'm thinking, you, these people don't know what they're doing. There's no contract. Um, and they don't know what they're doing because they don't even know where they want it. And uh, somewhere they got their wires crossed. And um, my first was mistake was not, you know, was to do it without a contract. My, but then again, you know, my good mistake, I mean, something that I did well was write a very good letter, a very unemotional, very factual letter that I am canceling the project due to abandonment. If you want to reinstate the project, I'm happy to do so, but it's going to incur more cost, and I'm going to want a contract, and it's going to be on my terms because they've been jerking me around, basically. But I said it in a very professional way. Never get emotional, ever. Just state the facts. It's not an emotional situation. Everybody still wants a win-win, but you know I'm stepping out because they're not, you know, they've abandoned it pretty much. So. They say, well, we'll find a new place and we'll get back to you. Well, then now it's been another month, of course. And I said, my letter stands. You know, my letter stands. It is canceled. If you can actually perform and do what you say, then get, basically, I would say in a very nice professional way, yeah, you know, if you do it, I'll believe it kind of, you know. But um, if it ever comes, you know, if it's, it comes a year later and they still haven't responded or figured it out, then as far as I'm concerned, I also wrote that I, you know, all the materials in the sculpture pretty much belong to me. Then there's nothing they can do. But you know, I've never ever had that happen. And and other people in other businesses have said they have had that happen. And so again, another great point to say: always have a contract. Um, a deadline can be, you know, if you both agree that there isn't a drop dead deadline and it's within a few months. I've never been late with a project, um, but if there's a project where I don't have a deadline, people get very upset because they have it in their mind. They have ideas about the way it's supposed to go, and the, those aren't always correct. You know, they don't always know how long it's going to take. Um, so that has to be up pretty much up front, I think, even if it isn't a written. Um, you know, even if it's verbal, just say, okay, give yourself two extra months if you can. It always takes a little longer than you think um, because there's always unknowns even when you're making something you think you know what you're doing and you do things come up so anyway that's a, long, that's a long answer <laughs> lots of information <laughs> no but you always think when you first start you don't have contracts but all the famous um 
artists and painters and sculptors, they have contracts and yeah. we need to protect ourselves as artists. And even yeah. when they go into a secondary market, you know, we have to protect ourselves. So, but this has been great, Catherine. Well, thank, thank you so much nice. for I sharing have, so much of yourself. Oh, I'm happy. Thank you. Um, I have copies of some contracts. If you need copies just to show students oh. different types of contracts that I've used in the past that have been very good um, and, and, and simple. And, uh, you know, I can email them to you or something if it helps. You know. That would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think, well, we're almost out of time. Uh, but before we end, uh, Catherine, do you have any uh, macro level words of wisdom for our Webster students um, <laughs> who are thinking about I gotta write this down. potentially going into the realm of public art? Well, you know, ah. boy, there's so much to say. You know, I, I think um, part of it is, you know, do what you. Um, a state of mind really um i think if you go in wanting to do your best and i always do more than my best they always get more than they wanted and to me that's it's all on me i'm gonna do the very 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 best and I'm, i no matter what the the budget is i mean you have to make money of course but um you know i would say especially starting out you want more work and you want to be proud of what you've done and you want to do the best for the community as well and so it's really it's kind of like you are the leader and don't forget that you don't need a title to be a leader everybody's a leader really so and this is a, this is an opportunity you're hired to become the leader and so you have to take that on that's the it's an empowerment kind of thing you have to allow yourself to be able to take what you know and apply it and say, wait a minute, I understand this. You're hiring me to do this. So speak your voice and make sure you don't go along with something that doesn't feel right um, and speak up on that because you can get into trouble. And I don't say bad trouble, but I'm just saying if you're doing something that just doesn't feel right, then it affects the work and the work isn't going to have that, that voice that you want it to have. So I would say yes. And then the other thing I'd have to say is, of course, I'm a proponent of um, the new um, the new way of seeing things. Is if you really can imagine, you know, things in your mind as being successful and good and helpful, and, and that's what you're going to get. But if you don't, if you can't go there with your mind, then it won't happen. So I would say practice just knowing that everything you dreamed is actually going to become a reality and believe it because if you can't do that and you're artists so you're probably really good at this <laughs> cuz think about it we make stuff we don't even know you know we're we're making you know something out of a ball of clay out of nothing out of mud or a piece of paper that's blank heck if we can do that then we can dream big and we can make anything we want happen excellent um, so I would say, yes, just remember that and practice that. So if you find yourself going, oh, I can't do this, and don't let anybody tell you you can't do this. Because I've had, with some of my bigger projects, like the brick wall, I had people say, you can't do this. What do you think? Oh, you're crazy. You don't know how to do this. And I said, well, yeah, I'll figure it out one step at a time. <laughs> and I did. And I and if you if you have the audacity to do this, and I think, God, what are these? These people don't have a clue as to what, what it takes. Well, what does it take? It takes someone to just say, I can do it. That's li it's literally that simple and believing you can. So what kind of mind is that? That is definitely not a mediocre mind. That's a mind that thinks big and makes it happen. And so we, we all have that. We all have that inside of us. And I just want you to know that really. Well, those are awesome words to end on. Have the audacity to be great. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you again, Catherine, for coming and speaking to uh, our group of students and faculty today. It was a pleasure hearing you speak. And uh, yeah, I hope to, you know, in the, in the new world when everything is great to, to hopefully see you around St. Louis. Um, and yeah. Uh, to meet everybody there. Too. Wonderful. New budding artists making great work. 
I'd love to see what you come up with and absolutely share it with uh, me. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to let you go for today.